Welcome to, on the other hand, and a special welcome to Zaya, Jack Weinberg, Samira M, and any other new viewers. Previously I put out a video that discussed why BLM is controversial, and I intentionally avoided statistics and data because I didn't want to get bogged down in specific proofs behind the ideas. I feel like that was a good fit for that video, but here I'm going to take an in-depth look at some of the most prominent studies and data behind the claims people make about the existence and extent of systemic racism. On a side note, I've made a Discord for this channel, so feel free to come hang out and give feedback or have a discussion, or just share and enjoy some good political memes. Link is in the description below. Anyway, the concept of systemic racism is nebulous, so I'm going to be looking into statistics in the following areas. Redlining, inequality, mobility, education and job rates, black names on resumes, affirmative action, healthcare, punishment, crime, policing, and police shootings. Now I'm going to try to be as transparent about the data I reference, so links will be in the description below. Also, I'm not trying to put forward that the data I cite is the final word on a given subject. I'm simply trying to put forward the actual data behind many references people use when talking about systemic racism. That being said, I know there are countless studies you could cite for or against the ones I present. The big problem with any of this is that a single study or set of data isn't necessarily refuted by another. I'm just trying to present some data without things digressing into a spectacle like this. I want you to know that I think putting my well-being and my hope for positive change in the hands of my side's politicians is a wise thing to do. I trust them because they're not power-hungry people out to satisfy their insatiable appetite for power and control, at least the ones on my side. Your side's corrupt. Actually, the latest stats are 100% of your side's politicians are corrupt and 0% of my sides are. I think you've got that backwards. I'm certain I'm right, because the emotional intensity I have in here validates the truth of what I think. I hate how accurate that sketch is. Anyway, I'll do my best to present data to both back and refute systemic racism for each subject, and I'll try to point out the strengths and weaknesses of each study. And so you know my bias, I am a conservative, but because facts don't care about feelings... <laughs> Sorry, I think I'm funny. But because facts don't care about feelings, I hope my bias won't come too much into play. As a side note, I will be focusing on racism in the black community, as that is the current prevailing narrative. It's interesting that Asians and Hispanics aren't mentioned too often when discussing systemic racism. But anyway, let's jump right into the data. Redlining According to the Brookings Institute, redlining was the practice of outlining areas with sizable black populations in red ink on maps as a warning to mortgage lenders, effectively isolating black people in areas that would suffer lower levels of investment than their white counterparts, and it happened from 1933 to 1977. People arguing for the view of systemic racism could point to the current levels of home ownership, according to the U.S. Census, which shows that the percentage of white home ownership is 76%, black is 47 other is 61 and Hispanics is 51%. This current home ownership disparity can be linked to intergenerational home ownership, such as can be seen here. It's a pretty straightforward argument. People's level of home ownership is influenced by their parents' home ownership, and since black people were openly discriminated against as recently as 1977 in the housing market, black communities are still feeling the effects of redlining today, and this is an example of systemic racism. The weakness of this data is that the study about intergenerational home ownership doesn't go back to the time of redlining, so we are extrapolating from known data back in time. This also assumes that disparity is evidence of racism, which isn't unreasonable to consider, but also isn't necessarily the case. Many disparities probably exist to an extent from racism, but the question before us is how much of a given disparity is due to racism and what can be done to fix it. People arguing against redlining and systemic racism affecting modern day life could point to this study from the Brookings Institute that shows of redlined areas most residents who live there today are not black. So if blacks were specifically targeted by redlining in the 70s, this figure could be used to say that redlining did not keep black communities from moving out of these bad areas to make a better life for themselves. According to a report from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, for analytic estimates of discrimination, researchers need to be confident that individual instances of discrimination are more than isolated occurrences, and that they add up to a consistent pattern that favors whites and outweighs, in a statistical sense, any corresponding pattern that favors minorities. Two characteristics of mortgage financing make it especially difficult to reach definitive statistical estimates of discrimination. The first is that home mortgage lending process is a complex series of stages. Discrimination could be occurring at one or more of these, and it could take different forms at different stages. 
The second is that what everyone now acknowledges to have been deliberate discrimination by many institutions in American society in the past has left a legacy of economic inequality between whites and minorities that still exist today. This legacy includes racial and ethnic differences and characteristics that influence the creditworthiness of any mortgage applicant income, accumulated wealth, property values, and credit history. Much of the current debate about mortgage lending discrimination stems from disagreement about how much of minorities' differential success in obtaining mortgage loans is due to credit-relevant factors that vary with race or ethnicity and that may flow from the nation's discriminatory past, and how much is due to ongoing discrimination. And from the same report, here are some graphs showing that there are mixed results for lending outcomes for both black and white applicants. The weakness of this data is that the study from the Brookings Institute just shows that blacks don't exclusively live in previously redlined neighborhoods. This doesn't mean that redlining didn't hurt black communities, and presents the numbers by population, not by percentages, i.e., whites have larger population than blacks in the U.S., but are similarly presented in these redlined neighborhoods. So the big problem I see with talking about redlining and systemic racism is semantics. When we talk about systemic racism existing or not, does it mean that there has been racism, and its effects can still be felt today, or does it mean that the current system actively discriminates against minorities today? These are hard questions, and the data itself can't answer. The next topic is income equality. As with all topics, this topic is interconnected with the last one. Home ownership is a big driving factor of how much wealth a family has, and as seen in this chart, home ownership varies by race. People arguing for systemic racism could point to differences in lifetime earnings by race, and if you make less money, it's harder to accumulate wealth and pass it on to children. And they might point out that data shows that blacks are more likely to be unemployed, so it's hard to make money when you're unemployed. The weakness of this data is that it shows only how things are, not what they should be. Should we be comparing white income to black income with white income being the norm or standard and every other group interpreted as being oppressed or elevated relative to whites? Is unemployment an effect from racism or the cause of differences in average incomes? People arguing against redlining and systemic racism might point towards the incomes of the Asian community as an interesting case study. Does the Asian community make more because they are on top of the systemic racism hierarchy, or is there something more? Does the culture of Asian communities give them advantages and focus to perform well in high-paying jobs? Speaking of jobs, it might be pointed out that different people and different races and cultures tend towards different jobs, as can be seen in this database. They might point out that if a group of people tends to work higher paying jobs, would it not make sense that on average they would make more money? Finally, they might point towards single parent households as contributing to inequalities. If only one parent is available to work for a given family, the earning potential will be significantly less than a family with both parents. The weakness of this data is that cultural influences are very hard to quantify, and might very well be people applying stereotypes to try and make sense of the world. And are people interested in and choose lesser paying jobs voluntarily, or does need and less ideal circumstances push people into taking whatever jobs they can find regardless of pay? Much like the gender pay gap, racial income equalities come with many unknowns. How much do people willingly choose their career and corresponding income? How much is conscious choice? How much do cultural and societal norms and pressures play into individuals or group decisions? And how much do circumstances affect outcomes? More unanswered questions. The next topic is income mobility. Income mobility is a statistical forecast for how much you can expect to make as an adult based off how much your parents made. So someone arguing that income mobility is systemically racist might point out the disparities between children's income and parents' incomes as shown in this chart. And the same study also shows intergenerational average movements based on race. In discussing mobility, it is useful to understand that IGE is a coefficient that captures the statistical connection between parents' incomes and their children's incomes later in life. The higher value of IGE, the lower intergenerational mobility is. Anyway, this study from Pew points out that average across all levels, approximately half of the parental averages are passed on, making mobility difficult. And here's a graph that shows that one-tenth of the inheritance of parental income is attributed to the race of the individual. The weakness of this data is that most of these intergenerational mobility studies only show one generation, not necessarily trends across multiple generations. One generation should give an idea about how things are currently moving, but doesn't show how mobility has changed, for example, before and after the civil rights movement. And also again, systemic racism is assuming that these disparities are due to racism, but doesn't prove the cause, just highlights the disparity. Those arguing against systemic racism might use the same sources, like the one that shows that black-white income gap is entirely driven by differences in men's, not women's, outcomes. 
if racism was the primary driving factor, one might argue that men and women would see similar disparities between white and black men and women. They also might reference this and point out that the income gap has not significantly improved since 1967, which was the tail end of the civil rights movement. If racism was the driving factor behind that gap, they might argue that the gap should have closed to an extent. Finally, they might argue using a study Ben Shapiro is fond of citing. The Brookings Institute study that shows that if you graduate high school, work full-time, and wait till 21 to have a child, you have a 98% chance of moving out of poverty. But just because data is not clear-cut showing disparities and equality doesn't mean that racism is not a significant factor in these racial gaps. Also, just because we've gotten further away from legalized discrimination does not mean society has necessarily gotten better. Lastly, the three roles are dependent on finishing high school, but the funding and safety of that school or support at home varies widely not to mention the study assumes everyone can find full-time employment. Having the means and resources available to you from your parents and community is a huge leg up in this world and can greatly improve your mobility. However, not having a leg up doesn't mean things are impossible, just more difficult to make a good life for yourself. Disparities in mobility are present, but how much of these disparities can be directly attributed to racism or its effects, and how much is culture or choice? Well, one thing is for sure. Income mobility is greatly dependent on our next topic, job rates. Completion of high school can be seen here, and you can see whites tend to outperform blacks, but Asians do the best, with Hispanics faring slightly better than blacks. And this graph shows college outcomes after six years, and very similar trends hold for the races. Those arguing for the idea of systemic racism might point out that the disparities are fairly consistent between these two, which points to a racist hierarchy that is constant throughout education. Those arguing against might point out that different cultures put different values on education, and this can be seen by wider disparities in voluntary higher education versus mandatory secondary education. Now moving on to jobs. If you look at the unemployment rate by race, you can see there are disparities between different ethnicities, and you can also see the devastating numbers during this pandemic. This relates to the jobs ethnicities tend to choose, and that can be seen here. Those arguing for the concept of systemic racism might point towards the higher unemployment rate for blacks, and lower rates of unemployment in fields like STEM can be a sign that systemic racism is at work. Those arguing against it might point out that more technical fields tend to have higher retention rates for their specialized skills. The hard part with education especially is that the quality and support in secondary education is largely out of one's hands. And when it comes to jobs, how much does race play into landing the jobs themselves? That leads us on to black names on resumes. Those arguing that systemic racism is real often put forward studies like this that show that black names get less callbacks than white names. Here are some of the details from this study. It took place from July 2001 to July 2002 in Boston, and July 2001 to May of 2002 in Chicago. They sent 5,000 resumes to 1,300 ads responding to employment ads in newspapers. Those arguing against this study often point to a similar study, but instead of using obviously racial first names, it focused on ethnic last names. And here are some details from that study. It took place from 2013 to 2014 across seven cities, and issued 9,000 resumes to online job postings. The second study compared employer callbacks across three groups, black, Hispanic, and white, instead of just two. Second, the data was more recent, and third, they did not use distinctly African-American sounding first names. Researchers have indicated concern that these names could be interpreted by employers as being associated with relatively low socioeconomic status. So the question is, how much do we read into names on resumes? Do we use first names as stand-in information for other information, or is it right pickings for unconscious bias? Maybe it's a bit of both, but then the question is, which is more dominant? The study you find more compelling probably reflects your worldview. Confirmation bias is a beast. The next topic I've heard a lot about during this pandemic is healthcare disparities. One of the most common arguments I've heard for this relates to the death rate of pregnant women, as cited in this New York Times piece that says, African American, Native American, and Alaskan Native women die of pregnancy-related causes at a rate three times higher than those of white women, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported on Tuesday. Or I've heard things like this article from CNBC that states, Nearly 23% of COVID-related deaths in the U.S. are African American as of May 20th, even though the black community make up roughly 13% of the U.S. population. And it says this is because income inequalities and disparities in access to health care tend to hurt minority and low-income populations more than others. Those who argue against systemic racism might point out some of the flaws in these studies. For example, the CDC study on deaths during pregnancy state, 
approximately 3 in 5 pregnancy-related deaths were determined by MMRCs to be preventable, and preventability did not differ significantly by race or ethnicity or timing of death. And also, the higher proportion of pregnancy-related deaths in the late postpartum period among black women is likely attributable to a higher proportion of pregnancy-related deaths due to cardiomyopathy among these women. The same CNBC COVID article also states, Conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and asthma that tend to plague African Americans more than other groups can contribute to more COVID-19 deaths. So different races are prone to different health concerns. For general reference, here's some data from the CDC on the most common causes of death broken down by race. The big differences between black and whites are Alzheimer's, respiratory, the flu, suicide, and homicide. Also for reference, here is insurance data by race. Note the disparity between private insurance and Medicaid. So, are these health disparities outgrowths of systemic racism? That's a good question. Some is definitely due to physical differences, some to insurance and healthcare differences. But the hard question is how much, and what remaining part could be credibly considered racist? It can be hard to answer these questions, because you don't want to get caught in circular reasoning that disparities in healthcare leads to disparities in income, which leads to disparities in healthcare. Don't get me wrong, feedback loops do exist, but they can sound like uncompelling circular reasoning. Now, on to affirmative action. To kick off this section, here's a clip from Vox talking about the history of affirmative action. It was originally a way for colleges and universities to give special consideration to racial minorities to help undo the effects of past discrimination. And for many schools, it meant setting aside a certain percentage of their seats for minority applicants, including the University of California Davis Medical School. But that changed in 1978 because of this man, Alan Backe. Backe was rejected twice by the UC Davis Medical School, so he filed a lawsuit. Back then, the school reserved 16 of the 100 seats for minority students in an effort to remedy past discrimination. It was a quota. Baki argued he had higher academic scores than several minority students who were accepted. And in 1978, the Supreme Court sided with Baki. The court said the school couldn't use quotas to racially balance the student body, and that they couldn't consider race to remedy past racial discrimination. The reasoning? Justice Lewis Powell wrote that societal discrimination is not a valid reason for considering race. So Baki was admitted to UC Davis and became a doctor. 97 medical students graduated there today, among them Alan Baki. But his case didn't end affirmative action. It just redefined it. Here's the rest of Justice Powell's decision. The only state interest that fairly may be viewed as compelling on this record is the interest of a university in a diverse student body. So university administrators could no longer use affirmative action to address past discrimination, but they could use it to create a diverse student body. And to be fair, diversity is beneficial to everyone. For example, research shows that it exposes students to different ways of thinking, which helps them better solve problems. But here's what's so confusing. The court said colleges couldn't use quotas to create diversity, but later the court said colleges needed concrete diversity goals. So how do you have a goal without naming an actual number? Well, one way would be to give bonuses to all students of a certain race. But in 2003, the court said that was not allowed. Instead, schools could consider an individual student's race if it was a factor of another factor. All of this means that our debates tend to paint a picture of affirmative action that just isn't correct. It's not a racial bonus or quota, and it's not about historical discrimination. It's a very narrow and frankly confusing tool for colleges to create more racial diversity. Those who disagree with Vox's perspective might point out that ethnic diversity doesn't necessarily benefit all students. Diverse cultures could definitely bring different perspectives to a class on religion, but doesn't tend to make a difference in the class of calculus too. And it's an understandable but interesting logical leap to say that different ethnicities necessarily result in different cultures. Statistically, a black student is more likely to have come from a black neighborhood, but if a white family adopts a black child, how much cultural diversity is really associated with their ethnicity? An interesting side note is that affirmative action is also present in scholarships and grants, as well as jobs. 
Private scholarships and private businesses often make ethnic diversity a priority, and though they are still limited by laws for equality, they have more wiggle room in some areas than public colleges. Anyway, back to college admissions specifically. SAT scores tend to vary by race, as can be seen in this graph. The question is, are these differences a fact of life or a problem to be fixed? And how much of these differences are because of confounding factors such as wealth or education versus systemic racism? There are many questions when it comes to affirmative action, such as, how much should college admissions be based on standardized test scores versus individual circumstances? If scores were only thing considered, Asians would have a large advantage and blacks would be at a disadvantage. But if other factors are taken into consideration and blacks are accepted into colleges at a higher rate than their scores dictate, that means that the more exclusive colleges made room for a lower scoring student over a higher scoring student. Is it fair to let someone of a different ethnicity in with a lower test score? What kind of message does that send to hardworking students in a majority ethnicity? If someone is less academically qualified to get into a college or a job, but they still get it, are they being set up for failure? If affirmative action is widely employed, can a minority student or employee ever be certain they actually qualified for their position, or will they always think they are an imposter with different standards because of an immutable characteristic? And what point does elevating a perceived disadvantaged group actually turn them into a new advantaged group? These are hard questions, and I feel like where you come down on them is in part determined by how much you value equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. Now, let's move on to school discipline. People arguing for the existence of systemic racism might reference how black students receive more disciplinary action per population than other races. Those who argue against it might point out that the disparity is not strictly a race problem, it is especially a problem for black males. And comparing disciplinary action by population might not be as accurate as disciplinary actions by infractions. Assuming behaviors are identical across race and cultural lines doesn't seem to make tons of sense. This is an important argument that will come up again and again as we get further into policing. Speaking of which, let's talk about crime for a bit. Let's jump through some general statistics taken from the FBI to give some context. Here's general stats for the past 10 years. Specifically, here are graphs of population, violent crime, murder, and robbery. And here's a breakdown of murder in 2018. And here is some of that data in graph form. And here is data on arrests. And again, here are graphs to show the total arrests, violent crime arrests, murder arrests, and robbery arrests all by race. So here's the question. How should we view this data? People arguing for the view of systemic racism point out that black Americans are disproportionately represented in these areas according to population. People who argue against that concept say that crime isn't measured in populations and raw numbers, but in reports. And Sean explains this well from the channel called Actual Justice Warrior. Now the first thing that you need to understand is that crime is neither measured in arrests nor convictions. Crime is actually measured in reports. And you know this intuitively without me spelling it out for you, but I'm going to do this anyway. Think about if you're driving a car and then somebody comes up to you and they carjack you and you make a report to the police that you were just carjacked. But they never arrest the guy who did the carjacking and because they never arrested him, they never convicted him. Does that mean that that carjacking did not happen? Of course not, because obviously you were carjacked, you lost your car, that was reported. That's what we measure crime in, reports, not arrests, not convictions. Now departments like the NYPD use a system called CompStat in order to determine where police should end up patrolling. And CompStat may sound a little bit complicated, but it really isn't. All it is, is the police mapping reports geographically and sending patrols to high crime areas. These areas are not patrolled due to the racial or ethnic makeup of the population. This is solely based on the history of crime reports in those areas. And the reason they use reports and not arrests or convictions is because that's not how we measure crime, and also, it's way easier to respond to a surge in reports than it is to a surge in arrests or a surge in convictions that could happen years later down the line. As far as I can tell, the FBI doesn't have data on reports, but it's interesting to compare crime to arrests. Now some might say that because policing is systemically racist, it only makes sense that there are more reports and arrests of black Americans, because the officers are looking for it. Those who argue against this idea point out that different individuals and also different cultures have different views, tendencies, and actions as a whole. If everyone behaved the same, we would be much more like the Borg than we would be human. 
So if we see more crime in and from the black community, does that mean they are being oppressed and overrepresented due to racism? Or does it mean that their culture and actions result in more arrests and crime? And if both are happening, which is more dominant? These are good questions, and if you find answers, let me know. Let's take a short detour into sentencing now. This data comes from the United States Sentencing Commission, and I'm just going to read some highlights from their summary, but the full report is linked in the description. Black male offenders continue to receive longer sentences than similarly situated white male offenders. Violence in an offender's criminal history does not appear to account for any of the demographic differences in sentencing. Black male offenders receive sentences on average 20% longer than similarly situated white male offenders, accounting for violence in an offender's past in the fiscal year 2016. Female offenders of all races receive shorter sentences than white male offenders during the post-report period, as they have had for the past four years. So, some follow-up questions. Are disparities between black and white males due to racism, or are they indicative of other external factors such as access to legal help or acceptance level of plea deals? The study controlled for acceptance of plea deals, but not anything I could see in regards to offered plea deals, and admittedly, I'm no expert on prosecution. An interesting thought is if you attribute the race disparity to racism, it would also make sense that the gender disparity is attributable to sexism. So we need more black men's rights activists, I guess? Finally, on to the hot topic of the day, police shootings. So BLM has been very active of late on account of the killing of George Floyd. So here is a graph showing the lifetime risk of being killed by police officers broken down by each race. Then, here is a look at the most recent years of people shot to death by the police, also broken down by race. So I could dig deep into this data, but Nuance Bro already did it, so I'm going to show a clip of his video here. So let's take a look at the numbers. Now this is the infamous Washington Post Fatal Force database. So it shows here 999 people have been shot and killed by police in the past year. They have data going back to 2015 all the way up until today. And if we scroll down, we can see this graph right here. And it says, the rate at which black Americans are killed by police is more than twice as high as the rate for white Americans. So here we have the black population at about 42 million, the white population at about 197 million, but we have blacks being killed by police at 31 per million of their population and whites being killed at 13 per million of their population. So even though more white people were killed, 2,500 compared to blacks at 1,304, blacks are less of the population, therefore they have a higher per capita rate of being killed by police. Now, of course, those were the number for all police killings via shootings, and Steven Crowder did say unarmed. So how do the numbers stack up for unarmed? Because maybe he's correct there. Well, let's do the math real quick. So we go to the Washington Post page, and we go to the database, and we plug in male, white, unarmed. Now, the population of white total is 197 million, and of course, half of that would be male. So we take this number of 132 and we divide that by half of 197 million, which is 98 and a half million. And just to get a nice per capita rate, we'll multiply this by 1 million. And we get 1.34 just about. Now let's do the same thing for black where we have 117 people shot and killed by police. Now remember the number for blacks was 42 million, so half of that would be 21 million. So we take 117 divided by 21 million, multiply by 1 million, and we get 5.57, which divided by 1.34, which we got earlier, would get us 4.15 or 4.16. So proportionately, unarmed black men are killed at a rate four times higher, more than four times higher than unarmed white men. So when the kid tries to say, well, there's more white people in the United States and Steven Crowder tries to come back with the retort of no, 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 as a percentage. No, not like before where I said, oh, well, there, you know, there's more white people who uh, are on welfare than black people. And the kid said, well, as a percentage of the population, you know, like proportionally. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, as a percentage, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now this time he's saying, oh no, no, even as a percentage. Well, 
it doesn't exactly make sense because yeah, if there are more white people, there's going to be a higher percentage generally uh, because they're a higher portion of the population. But per capita is what we're talking about as a proportion of the population is what we're talking about. And that seems to be what he's talking about. And he even seems to catch himself later when he says, oh, well, you can say blacks are only 10 to 15% of the population. So there you go. And here's the thing. Crowder didn't have to go down this route. You can accept the numbers as they are. You can accept the fact that blacks are killed at a higher proportion by the police than their proportion of the population and relative to whites while still believing that blacks are not being fatally targeted in a discriminatory manner. It would have been great if Steven Crowder could have brought up studies like this. This is the Perils of Police Action, a cautionary tale from US data sets. And if we scroll down, we can see when it comes to fatal incidents, this is per 10,000 arrests. So they're, me they're measuring based on actual contacts, arrests, stops, things like that. So when you control for the amount of times police are interacting with people via stops and arrests, we can see that white non-Hispanics are killed at 0.7 per 10,000 stops and arrest, and blacks are killed at 0.7 per 10,000 stops and arrest as well. It's equal. Here's another study by Roland Fryer, a professor of economics at Harvard, an empirical analysis of racial differences in police use of force. And if we go to the abstract, we can see on the most extreme use of force, officer-involved shootings, we find no racial differences in either the raw data or when contextual factors are taken into account. The interesting thing about this study, however, is that when it comes to non-lethal uses of force, they found that blacks and Hispanics are more than 50% more likely to experience some form of force on force in interactions with police. And even when they add in controls, it reduces, but cannot fully explain these disparities. So just wanted to add that little nuance in there for you. He could have brought up articles like this from the Washington Post that says, aren't more white people than black people killed by police? Yes, but no. And if you scroll down, you can see African Americans, however, account for 24% of those fatally shot and killed by the police, despite just being 13% of the US population. But if we go to this Washington Post article, are black or white offenders more likely to kill police? We can see there were 511 officers killed in felonious incidents and 540 offenders from 2004 to 2013, according to FBI reports. Among the total offenders, 52% were white and 43% were black. So when we look, we can see that they're 13% of the population, yet they're 24% of those fatally shot, but they're 43% of those who are killing police officers when it comes to felonious incidents. So while blacks are killed more than their percentage of the population, they are not necessarily killed higher than their proportion of what the behavior would dictate, or when it comes to things like encounters with police, stops and arrests, things like that on a per capita basis. So what are the conclusions for police shootings? It's complicated. On the one hand, it might seem like black people are being blatantly discriminated against and disproportionately targeted according to population. But on the other hand, that disparity completely disappears when the control is no longer population but is based on arrests. So like with most subjects I have covered, it depends on how you look at it and how you define systemic racism. So there's a lot of data here. I'd like to make some statements of fact and let you draw your own conclusions. Disparities exist between the black and white communities in the US. Some studies seem to conclude contradictory things, but most studies tend to capture a small slice of the very complex and interconnected society we live in. Most studies and datasets are referenced only for the most interesting or extreme sounding statistics, and interpretations of data and measurements vary based on assumptions and worldviews. So as I see it, seeing systemic racism in many ways is comparable to seeing a glass as half empty or half full. People look at the reality of the amount of water, but then disagree on which is the proper way to view the world. For me, I know that people are capable of being horrible, but I prefer to be an optimist and view the world as a good place with good people that has room for improvement, rather than a place of ever-present racism. And ultimately, regardless of which view you take, if you want to make the world a better place, you should take a look at yourself and make that change. Thank you.